Welcome to Coffee with Lynette. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full service physical gold and silver dealer specializing in strategies to help you survive and thrive through the reset that, as my guest will probably agree with me, has already begun. And I am very happy to welcome today Gerald Salente. He founded the Trends Research Institute in 1980 and has earned a reputation as the most trusted name in trends by accurately forecasting hundreds of social, business, consumer, environmental, economic, political, entertainment, and technology trends using his own global gnomic methodology. It is so accurate that the New York Post stated, if Nostradamus were alive today, he'd have a hard time keeping up with Gerald Salente. And I would agree with that. His motto is, think for yourself. And you know that is something that we really embrace here at ITM Trading. And you know, his an analysis certainly gives us always, always a lot to think about, especially since this is one person that does not mince words. Prior to founding the Institute, Gerald was a government affairs specialist and an executive assistant to the Secretary of the New York State Senate. So you could really say that he started his career inside the belly of the beast and really understands how that system works. He is the author of bestsellers and he has in 2015 a passion project of his, which we're going to talk more about in a minute, Occupy Peace, which he started in 2015. It is the only peace program with an actual action plan that puts the people back in charge. Oh, I don't know, kind of like it was in the Constitution. What a concept. He is an author, a teacher, and an absolutely tireless and fearless fighter. I am very, very happy to welcome back and, and it has been way too long. Gerald Salente, welcome to Coffee with Lynette. It is so good to see you, my friend. Oh, thank you so much, Lynette. Thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, they're very, very warming. Thank you. Well, I could go on and on, but there's so much that's going on. I'm thinking that we should just kind of jump right into it. And um, I was listening, you know, I love to listen to your work. And you said something that was really interesting, and I'm going to ask you to clarify it for our viewers. Because you said that the crash in 2008 was a bottom-up crash, and this time it's a top-down crash. What did you mean by that? Well, when you looked at all of the um, the subprime mortgages and mm -hmm. you know you don't have a job you don't have uh, any money don't worry about it you could buy a house sign over right. here you want a car you don't have any dough you have a lousy credit rating don't worry about it you could get one so it was the whole subprime it was the bottom up you know i remember mm -hmm. driving around and you couldn't drive a day without seeing a flatbed truck with a half of a modular home on it that was going somewhere and right. another one following it. They were building like crazy. It was the bottom up. And this is a top down because since the panic of 08, the central banksters dumped in all that monetary methadone to keep the bull running. Hey, too big to fail. Let's make them even bigger. Oh, we only have a $250 trillion global debt bubble. Oh, and all of these mergers and acquisitions, putting everybody else out of business and the bigs getting bigger and having all that debt. What's going to happen when this goes down? And we're saying the greatest depression has already begun. You know, right. it doesn't just happen overnight. It's in stages and stage one is here. So now your debt has to be paid as your businesses are going down. As the rich got all the dough in the top, that's what's coming down first because the bottom's already, it's what it is. Right. So this is a top-down crash. Well, would that um, pertain to the recent gyrations in the repo markets? Perfectly stated. What did they put in? Two, over $200 billion? 
already in a week? Yeah, actually, are they going to- I, I was looking at their schedule this morning on uh, the Federal Reserve website. I think it totaled something by the by the end of this week or something like that. Don't hold me to it, but something like five hundred and twenty billion. Yeah, is what they have planned. Yeah. And so what is that again? It was this QE4 and five and six and seven. It's a whole scam. And who are they giving it to? Again, the top. Exactly. They need the money and they make up the story. Well, you know, it was this or that. Oh, what did interest rates hit last Monday and Tuesday around 10% in the repo market? From two. From two. Like all, all, almost overnight. Yeah. So right? what I'm saying is it's a top down crash and you made the perfect point with the repo market. Yes, absolutely. Um, and just kind of staying in there because what I'm seeing is a massive amount of inverted yield curves where you have the uh, shorter dated, except for this repo thing that went from two to 10, but mostly you have the shorter dated uh, debt instruments paying you more than the longer dated debt instruments. And you know how does that fit into this? And I think uh, I think it was you that, and I was wondering about this, so I was appreciative that you brought it up. Thirty central banks have lowered interest rates so far this year. Yeah, and and who ever heard of negative interest? Well, go to Switzerland; <laughs> it's minus zero seven five. Yes. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And you know, Lynette, you're a wonderful woman. You do a great job. Thank Buy you. one of these 30-year bonds, and in, and you can cash it in. You'll get less than what you paid for it because you, you're such a wonderful person. And there are 17 trillion that have been sold. I mean, it's a baloney. The ba- the governments are buying them up. Same thing in Japan with their negative interest rates. They had negative bond yields now for years. The government's buying them up. The government's propping up this, the equity markets. It's one big scam, and it's it's falling apart now. That, that is much of what we're seeing in the repo market. That's the plumbing that just keeps all of this scam going, and it essentially froze. It froze. And they made up the story, you know, well, it was tax time, and they had this. Come on. What are you kidding? Right, because you know. those are all things that we know. And, and, and we also know this. It will be a black swan event, something that nobody can anticipate that will most likely overwhelm the system. But, you know, when we look at these negative rates, when we look at all of this, I mean, how much can they do? That's the big question. Yeah, it is. And nobody knows because they keep making up, you know, these schemes I'm dreamed of. Whoever heard of quant, they didn't teach you quantitative easing and (laughs) negative interest rates in economics 101 at graduate school. I mean, they make this stuff up. And when you talk about a black swan, um, the uh, I one of the things to look at is what what's going on in the in the Middle East and what's yes. going on in Hong Kong. Yeah, you know those are two things that just you know out of nowhere, boom, here they are, and uh, it could get a lot worse, and that could bring things down very hard. Could we talk a little bit more about Hong Kong? I mean, do you think? First of all, my question is, how long do you think the Chinese government is going to tolerate the protests? And do you think we could have another Tiananmen Square? They're not going to tolerate it at all. They're going to put it down. And the people there know it. You know, when you read read about what was going on in Hong Kong and how they couldn't stand the mainland Chinese coming there, they're two very different people, two very different cultures. And, uh, of course, the Hong Kong, you know, was under the British empire you know so they had a little bit of different vibe in them and it's and it's the business capital of the world and the people there are tired of living under the conditions they're living under you know the average person you know they're sleeping in shoe boxes basically a lot of people and they want dramatic change and the chinese government's going in the opposite direction but they're gonna i mean you you have a country uh, a country you have a, a place of seven point what three four million people and china has what 1.4 billion so it's not even a, it's not even a close uh, game. China's going to put it down. But the big thing is you're already seeing, for example, gold flowing out of Hong Kong, going to places like Singapore. You're going to start seeing the banks starting to move out. That's the hub of the central banksters gateway to Asia. Exactly. So that could really hurt China if, if it goes in the wrong direction. 
So, you know, it, it really makes me wonder, they're really walking a tightrope because if they did go in and just, you've got what, about a third of the population in Hong Kong that's now participating in protests, something, something along that order. If they went in and they got very aggressive militarily, I mean, uh, that's not going to look very good to the rest of the world. That's probably why they haven't done it yet. But well, well, they're not concerned about the rest of the world. They're only concerned about the bottom line, and that's the banking system. Just like the rest of the world could care less that over 100,000 Yemenis have been slaughtered by the Saudis with the bombs delivered by the United States, France, and the UK, mostly coming out of the U.S., they don't care. People don't care. Uh, the, the, the governments don't care. All they care about is money. That, that's about it. Yeah, unfortunately, we've seen that so many times. But, you know, all right, let, let's kind of shift focus just a teeny bit. I want to go back to negative rates because there was something I wanted to talk to you about it. And I'm sorry I didn't do it a second ago. But the negative rates, we know in Denmark, they're now issuing mortgages, 10-year mortgages, yeah. right? At, and they're paying you to buy real estate. So I get a lot of questions on when is the real estate bubble going to pop? And, and technically, I think that all had already begun. But if they pay you to buy a house, even when that house is overvalued, I mean, could that keep it going for a while longer? I mean, that's insanity. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The whole thing is insanity. I mean, you know, just take a look at the people running governments for the most of our lifetimes. You want to talk about insane people, you know, as I call them, the repulsive kids and the dumbo craps. You know, so insanity is their normal game and with the central banksters as well. But I agree. And they're already, matter of fact, you're seeing a little boost in the housing market coming up again. And they're just going to keep lowering interest rates, keep it going for a while. And if they go into negative and they do what Denmark is doing, uh, they'll they'll keep it floating for a while. That's but again, at some point, it's going to it's going to crash. And the crash again is going to come from the top. It's already happening here in New York. You know, your luxury apartments, luxury condos aren't right. they're not doing well at all. The vacancy rates in the richer areas in, in Manhattan, they're very high. They're looking at 20 percent. You know, so it's going to fall from the top. Well, that's a big problem considering that, and this is not just in the U.S., but in China and globally, they're counting on the average consumer to support all of these markets. But, you know, can the consumer continue to consume at the level that they need to to keep all these bubbles floating? No, that's why you're seeing in India well, their car sales down last month. In fact, by the seventh consecutive month, they were down 41 percent. Nothing to do with trade wars. Right. They're not involved. Yeah. Then you go you, you go all over the world. It's the same thing. You go to China. Twenty five percent of China's GDP is related to real estate. Exactly. And 80 percent of their GDP is consumer spending between 75 to 80 percent. So you're 100 you're percent right. How are they going to keep the consumer spending? So they're going to keep coming up with more games. But to me, what's going to bring it down is that black swan event that you were mentioning. Which one it will be? Who knows? You know, can't see those black swans. <laughs> so uh, but I think it's going to be it may be I shouldn't say I think it's going to be. It may be geo geopolitical as well as an economic black swan. Yeah, it could it could come from either place. But you brought up India and India, to me, over time, is just such a fascinating test case because the Royal Bank of India came out in 99 with that paper on how to dematerialize gold because the people have been through it so many times. So they wear their wealth, and that makes it challenging for governments to attach. And we saw what happened, you know, in 2016 when they demonetized what? something like 85% of the currency, all of a yeah. sudden, boom. And at the same time, they did some level of gold confiscation. So going back to India, which everybody's saying, wow, what a fabulous country. Look at their stock market. They just lowered taxes. I mean, 
it's just constant financial engineering after financial engineering. But how long, I mean, that's the question. How long can all of this financial engineering keep things floating? Well, it's, well, it's wearing out. And again, with India, there's another black swan. All of a sudden, hey, you know, Kashmir doesn't have its autonomy anymore. We're ripping up that 1947 agreement. And now you have two nuclear powers, Pakistan and India, you know, fighting over this this issue. Where is it going to go? So again, when all else fails, they take you to war. Exactly. And that's what Modi did as the economy is reversing. And what is the nifty 50? It's, it's not really doing that great right now, is it? The, the, uh, the, the Indian stock market. And they, they went through a very oh. tough time after his election. So when all else fails, they take you to war. There's a whole history of that. And again, you can see what's going on. History is repeating itself. It's the it's yeah. it's trade wars, currency wars, world war. Exactly. And it was the greatest depression. That's what happened during the Great Depression. And it's repeating itself now. But here's this is interesting, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, this immigration problem that's sweeping the world. Yes. Think what's going to happen when the greatest depression hits. Think of the the hundreds of millions of people that are going to be leaving their countries, their continents, to find, to get away from poverty, crime, uh, corruption, violence. When things go down, you think it's bad now? Go back to the oh. Great Depression. We only had 2 billion people on the planet. Eh, we've only added 5.5 .5 billion in 90 years. So... It kind of sounds like, you know, what's most likely to happen is some level of depopulation. Well, if they you know, go to war. Got, yeah, exactly. It'll be, yeah, it'll be a big depopulation. <laughs> nice knowing you. And that's yeah. the other thing. You know, that's the other thing. You know, I, I was brought into uh, Virginia Military Institute when um, I wrote the book Trends 2000. Back in mm -hmm. 2000, they brought me in to talk about new millennium warfare. And there's a saying that generals are always fighting the last war, and they're doing it again. These aircraft carriers and battle fleets, they're, they're useless. But you just exactly. saw what happened. You just saw what happened with the Houthis, although the line being sold to us, it was the Iranians, sent a drone into Saudi Arabia and wiped out their, one of their oil facilities and the world's largest oil refinery. This is the poorest country Yemen in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The point that I'm making is that it's going to be hypersonic weapons. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be, could, it, could you imagine tens of thousands of really sophisticated drones flying in at one time all over a country? How are you going to stop it from happening as they're dropping chemical warfare, bombs, whatever? It's new millennium warfare. And the military has absolutely no clue. By their deeds, you shall know them. They're always fighting the last war. So, if, by the way, that's why Trump didn't attack Iran after they shot down that drone, that $200 million drone. Because the, the United States fleet in the Straits of Hormuz would have been Pearl Harbor. Harbor, right. Yeah. Well, just staying on that for a minute, because the Aramco IPO is coming out. We've got oil that, frankly, hardly really moved at all on that on that whole airstrike. But, you know, what do you think about the Aramco IPO with them coming out? I mean, for a while it was quiet. They went underground and did whatever they did to, I guess, make the books look cleaner to bring it out, but they need oil a whole lot higher than this, don't they? They need oil at about $100 a barrel. And now it was speaking, it's right around 63. And you made an excellent point. After the strike happened against Saudi Arabia's oil field, oil spiked the highest it ever had. And then it backtracked right away. Why? Because there's a global slowdown. Yep. And that and it has nothing to do with the trade war. They keep putting that out there. It's the addicted bull that was shot up with monetary methadone to juice the markets. 
is running out of juice. And going, is, so is Aramco deal going to work? Well, they're already trying to pressure the people in Saudi, the rich people there, to, to buy into it. I don't believe it's going to. Again, unless there's a wild card, because if war breaks out in the Middle East and you see oil spike, oil prices spike to over $100 a barrel, oh yeah, then they'll buy into it. But by the way, it's also going to crash economies around the globe and, and equity markets will be really, really devastated. Again, oil prices go up. We've talked about India. Oh, oh, their rupee goes down and they, are, they have to buy more oil and they, they import 80% of their oil and their rupee is down. What's that going to do to India? They're already in bad shape. China, the world's largest importer of oil. What's going to happen if oil prices go up very high? They're already having a problem with their economy. You look at the numbers coming out all the time. Yeah. So it, it'll be devastating. Exactly. And just going back to China for just a brief little second, but it was in uh, May 2000, I'm pretty sure it was 2017 or 18, when their yield curve first inverted. But, pff, you know, the guy talking heads on, on mainstream media, they just want, eh, it's not, it's different this time. It's always different, isn't it? I know. This yep. time it's always different. They but never get it right. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. You know, by their deeds, you shall know them. I love when the Federal Reserve tells you what they're doing. Oh, yeah, go back and read the minutes before the uh, when, when the crash was happening in 2007, 2008. They didn't have a clue. But in the United States of America, the land of the free, we the little people aren't allowed to le read the minutes until five years later. So you forgot what happened. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, they can't really tell us the truth because we would make some different choices. Yeah. You know, what do you think about just kind of talking this through as well? What do you think about the new FedNow payments program and the digital currencies that the biz, you know, is really encouraging? All those central banks, you better get those digital currencies all tied in with those payment systems, private, public, Let's get them all together so everything goes to the central bank. Do you, uh, what are you thinking is going to happen with that? Because that They'll scares probably the heck do out it. of me. They'll probably do it because there's no resistance. You know, you mentioned what was going on in, what's going on in Hong Kong. Yeah. A third of the population taking to the streets. It's a big deal. Here's a country in America. You're lucky to get a million people out into the streets when, when they had, you know, for any event. And then they out of the streets the next day. You know, they're gone. We don't have the fight in this country anymore. Most people, the things that you're talking about, Lynette, most people have never heard about. We're, we're talking a foreign language. So the people, there's no fight anymore. And when you look at the, 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 the two-headed one-party system, you know, they're all in bed together. Well, it's true. But see, you do give me a level of hope with your Occupy Peace program. Because Occupy Wall Street... The main problem there was that, in my opinion, that they really didn't understand what they were fighting for, that it was about their freedom and it was about the monetary system. So that was a pretty bold movement globally, but it fizzled out because there was no plan and, and I don't think any understanding. Can you talk a little bit more about your Occupy Peace program? Because having a plan is and really understanding what you're fighting for, you know, maybe we can change what you just said. Well, we can, uh, and, and that's part of what, it, what it's about. And by the way, uh, last Saturday, September 21st, was International Peace Day. What a mystery, hardly reported. Exactly. And, and what were they talking about? Climate change. Okay, great. But how about stopping these murderous wars going on? So Occupy Peace, number one, I'm here in Colonial Kingston, which you know very well from being yep. from here. And it was the first capital of New York State. And the seeds of democracy was sown here. Most of America's constitution that was written at the location right over my shoulder over here where the, uh, the Ulster County Court is, John Jay was a judge there. 
And when it was the first con capital of New York State, that constitution that was written there, most of America's constitution comes from the one that was written there. This is the third Dutch settlement. So when you honor the founding fathers, real men, not these little boys with big attitudes and couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag, we're going to war. George Washington, yeah, I think he spent Christmas Eve going across the Delaware to go fight. It wasn't waiting for Santa Claus, you know, or lighting up the Christmas tree. No foreign entanglements was his farewell address. Number two, bring home the troops, number one, secure the homeland and put them to work rebuilding our third world infrastructure, our rotted, stupid infrastructure. Take a trip on the New York subway. It's a night in Calcutta. And that's yeah. not an exaggeration. Then you give them skills because they don't have much by being in the service, unless, of course, you're a pilot, you know, but that's like a tiny percent. Number two, force Congress to vote to go to war, which they have not done since World War two. II. Yeah. A disgrace to the Constitution. Article yeah. 1, Clause 8, Congress has the power to wage war. Not El Presidente of Los Estados Unidos. Oh, no, look, we're changing the law. Screw you. The hell with you. I could care less, Lynette. What you care about the Constitution. Don't you know who I am? I'm Senator. You know what? I'll tell you what to do. I'm Congress, men, Congresswoman, this or that. I'll tell you what to do. Hey, you know what they forgot? Two words. Public servant. So the next element of, of occupied peace is to have a referendum on each state ballot. You want to go to war? Let the people vote. We're the ones that pay for the war with our money and our lives. We'll, well tell Congress how to vote. So that's Occupy Peace. Close the 800 plus bases in 80 countries overseas. Bring the troops home. You want us to secure the border? Do it with them. Don't be stupid and waste money building a wall that's antiquated stuff if you don't want people to come in. Put them to work rebuilding our infrastructure. Force Congress to vote to go to war and we'll tell them how to vote. Can we also force them to vote for sound money? Yes, because we should have direct, we should have, in my belief, direct democracy. We do not have a representative form of government. Any right. imbecile that believes that campaign contributions aren't bribes and payoffs when there are a lot of dough better grow up. Right. They don't represent us. They represent the people that pay them off. All they are, the politicians have become whores to their corporate pimps. So I want the system that they have in Switzerland. They haven't been at war since when? Ah, 1850. Right. All wars around them haven't been in them. The people vote, direct democracy. And we go, oh, well, that's a small country, people say. So what? You were talking before about digital currencies, blockchain right. technology. If we could... If we could transfer trillions of dollars in milliseconds and it's blocked, we could vote online with blockchain technology. So we the people can vote on all the issues. And then the other thing people say, well, the people are so stupid. Oh, yeah, like uh, Diane not so Feinstein, Nancy Pelosi, little Chucky Schumer, Mitch McConnell are smarter than you. Hello, exactly. I mean, you're the one, we are the ones that live in this world on a day-to-day -day basis. I think Congress needs to take back their responsibility with sound money because a lot of these wars, I mean, look, that was the justification every time. And the people don't realize it. In this country, gold has been confiscated three times. Uh, I every, didn't know that. Oh, yeah. When were the other two? I know the uh, 1933. Uh, well, okay, the War of 1812 and the Civil War. Really? Yes. So wow. every single time we have gone into war, and this is pretty typical, then they have confiscated gold so they could pay for all of the war machine. And then when people are bloodied and bruised, they go back to a gold standard. And there was about, I think, 42 to 45 years between those wars, which gave people a chance to recoup. But 
oh. once, you know, I think it was Ron Paul that said that it is no coincidence that the, uh, that perpetual wars began with, perpe I don't think I did it exactly right, but perpetual wars began with perpetual central banking. And we've been in a perpetual state of war. If you look at the timeline, it got shorter and shorter between wars until 1989. Then pff, we've just been in a perpetual state of war ever since then. And the other thing, too, when you're in a state of war and fear and terror, there's no creativity. You can't be creative in that mindset. And, exactly. and to me, it, it's that, you know, we have to embrace things such as beauty and elegance and and integrity and morality, and those are, you know, th those are oxymorons when they, when they, when they're, or, or, or when they're, when, or I shouldn't say oxymorons. They're what anathema. They're anathema to to uh, to war, and so you can't have them. Uh, you can't you can't build up to higher levels at this state of of ignorance and murder. And again, what has it accomplished? What has it accomplished? We got the the Afghan war going on now. It's 18 years? For what? And now you're, you're seeing these exactly. polls coming out. It, it's like 59% of the, the the veterans from these wars are against them, as well as the American people. Yet we're still there. Oh, and by the way, what is some 22 veterans are killing themselves every day? Suicide? Exactly. I mean, come on. It's not, I mean, how could, how could there be no caring about this? And it's up to us to do it. Because it they'll is. never do it. A hundred percent, because this is a justification. So all of those emergency acts that were put in place because of war that they haven't pulled out to put on us just yet, well, they're all there, they're all in place, they're all legalized, and when they need to, I'm thinking, we'll be reminded uh, the, of the fact that actually they can come in and confiscate legally absolutely every single thing that you perceive that you own. Isn't that word that you used wonderful legally? <laughs> legally. <laughs> yeah, they make they make up this stuff and then they call it the law. Exactly. And again, anybody wants to, you know, that, that of course to make Occupy Peace happen at a much higher level, we need, you know, real money behind it. You know, exactly. I put a lot of money behind. So anybody listening, you know, you want to put your your uh, your heart where your money, your money, where your heart is, you know, consider going to www.occupypeace.com. They, they wouldn't know how to deal with joy, beauty, elegance and and morality. You could beat them at every level on that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I also think that with what we have coming, you know, our, our world, whether we realize it or we do not realize it, has been made smaller and smaller yep. and smaller. I mean, how do you trap a wild boar? Slowly and with a lot of patience. You put up a fence, the boar comes and eats the food, and then all one side, then you put up another side, they come back, they get used to that other side, and before you know it, you have them all in a pen and they volunteered. And, you know, it's been my experience, and I think that's part of what we're seeing here too, that if the government or if Wall Street allows you to feel a little richer, right? Whether it's, it's just your perception that you feel that things are okay, that that's how they make all of these transitions. In that Fed Now, uh, it was a speech that one of the Federal Reserve Chair, I think it was Chilton, just gave. And in there, he said, well, at first, everything is going to look just the same because, hey, cash, it's going to mimic cash, like cash mimic gold. Okay, it's going to mimic cash. You'll have access to it 24 hours a day. It's peer-to-peer -peer and all of that. But then that's where it changes. So basically, they're going to lull you into this false sense of security. It's going to seem like it. But now when you go to the grocery store, I'm not doing this verbatim, but this is actually what he said. When you go to the grocery store, you will have no other choice but to pay with the Fed coin with the digital currency. And then they've got you because then there's no limitations on how low they can put those negative rates to attack your principal because it's not sound money. Yeah, it's it's the founding fathers must be rolling in their graves. 
Look what's, I, look what's happened to this nation. How terrible at it, so many different levels. Oh, and, and it's, it's not just here. It, it is globally. And, it's global. And, yeah. and I have to tell you, a big fear, a big concern that I have is that China is testing all of these full surveillance, full control. They're, you know, they're really on digital money. They're probably going to be the first one to bring out a central bank digital money. You know, if everything, if 100% of everything, uh, all your earnings, everything that you spend, every title to every asset that you own, if that is held inside the Fed first, well, what do you think can happen if they don't like your politics or choices? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and again, in, in this digital age with so many people who are so addicted, uh, and you mentioned China where... You know, people don't use that much cash at all anymore. You know, everything is their app. And, and so they're used to it. They don't care if, if there's a real money. And, and most people don't know the implications, the consequences of it. So they'll be able to push it right, right through very easy in, uh, in, the, in this new digital world. You know, there's a saying in the King James Bible that the meek shall inherit the earth. They spelled it wrong. The geeks have inherited the earth. And so... Uh, and, and that's, what's, that's what the way it's going to go. In China, by the way, the 20th century was the American century. The, as I see it, the 21st century is going to be the Chinese century. They're buying up the world. Oh, well, with all of this fiat money, but that also makes it, in my opinion, that much more important to be able to hold some real sound money physical gold and silver, not held in a vault offshore, because how are you going to get it when you need it, but close to you? Because if you don't, if you're not independent, then, you know, and you and I've talked a lot about food and the use of, you know, the, the way that they use food to help dumb down the people because they become addicted to all of this crap that makes them unhealthy. But you've got to have some real food, <laughs> You know, that keeps you mentally stimulated, but it's that physical. How do you feel about that as far as the physical gold and silver out of the system? I know you're a proponent of that. Oh, no, 100 percent. You know, 100 percent. And I tell the quick story what happened on 9-11. You know, I, I had forecast the USA Today used to run my top trends every year. And one of the ones in December, you could go to my website, trendsresearch.com and go we to the forecast. We have all those search. links below, by the way, yeah, for everything. Yeah, they're, they're, they're there. And, and I had four, the headline in USA Today read, in December 12th, 2000, 2001 won't be our year, Trendseer says. And I warned that a wave of anti-Americanism was sweeping the globe and Americans wouldn't be safe at home or abroad. People th never want to borrow worry about foreign policy. I forgot about Bill Clinton slaughtering all those Iraqis and other policies. Madeleine Albright on 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl when she was ambassador under Clinton to the United Nations. And, uh, uh, Leslie Stahl asked her, is the price of over 500,000 Iraqi children that are dead because of Bill Clinton's sanctions worth it? And she said, yes, it is. So oh. anyway, as we used That's to say disgusting. in the Bronx, payback's a bitch. So I knew something was going to happen. When 9-11 happened, some of the things I did right away is I'm watching CNBC that morning. And the guy said, well, you know, it looks like a plane hit the uh, World Trade Center. But let's not get too upset about this, blah, 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 blah. It was a perfectly clear day. You know, I've been flying in private planes a lot of years, doing hot air ballooning. How could something hit the World Trade Center? That's what went on my mind. Right. The next thing... Yeah, I'm watching it, and I see that explosion happen. I pick up the phone, and I called up. I forgot the name of the bank. It was bought out by Bank of America. And I had, there were things called, back then, certificates of deposit. You got interest on things. And I had all my company's money in CDs. I said, I want that money transferred over to Rhinebeck, where I was living at the time. The guy cuts me off, said, Mr. Salenti, certificates of deposit are financial instruments, they're traded on Wall Street, and Wall Street's closed. Uh-huh. Got it. Uh-huh. And that's when I came up with GC's three Gs, guns, gold, and a getaway plan. Yep. And my getaway plan was, if, you know, I, I'm a New Yorker, you can't tell by my accent. No, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and I know that area inside out, up all the way yeah. up down the Hudson River. Yeah. And they're saying the planes are coming down the Hudson. I'm saying, what if one hits Indian Point Power Plant, which is just about 40 miles north of New York City? There'll be chaos like you could not believe. Exactly. And that was my getaway plan. So I had, they had a thing in those days called maps. And I took out the maps. And I'm only four hours from the Canadian border. And I was looking for all back roads to the Canadian border. Because I knew they closed down the major highways. And I packed just enough clothes and things with one little suitcase, guns, gold, and a getaway plan, went over and bought, uh, uh, filled up Jerry Jugs, bought Jerry Jugs, filled them up with gas, as everybody's going berserk about what right. just happened. I had an action plan in. And that's what I'm suggesting to people. Yep. If you prepare for the worst and the worst doesn't happen, you lose nothing. If you don't prepare for the worst and the worst happens, you could lose everything. So I totally agree with you. Have gold where you can get it and no one else could touch it. Exactly. Because essentially, it's out of their control. I mean, and that's what we need to do because they're doing everything to get everything inside of their control. This is not, I've heard you talk about this too. This is not a democracy. Oh, In it's name a joke. only. It's a, no, it, they're spelling it wrong. It's D U H, democracy. <laughs> There you go. And again, you know, when we're talking about the slowdown going on, you know, look at the news coming out. You have the majority of the most wealthy people in the world. This is on CNBC are making plans now to secure their invest investments. They're concerned about, quote, a recession. Yeah. The majority of American people believe there's going to be a recession. They could feel it in their bones and they feel it in their pocketbooks. It's not going to be a recession. Way It'll worse. devolve into the greatest depression. Because what they're really doing is resetting the entire global financial system. Those negative rates are telling you, those inverted yield curves are telling you. I, I mean, I've said, period, that the system that we had set up died in 2008. And oh. all they've done is jury rig it to get to this point. But we have to go to a new system. They have no more interest rates and they have no more value left in the purchasing power of the fiat money. Yep, you, you nailed it. I mean, you said it perfectly. I agree 100% with you. So you and I are on the same page with food, water, energy, security, barterability. So I like silver mostly for that. And the gold for wealth preservation that if you have a getaway plan, you can stick that in your pocket invisibly. I mean, who's going to think that you've got any gold? Really, that's not normal in this country anymore. And you can go wherever you need to and instantly have purchasing power. Just think about it. If all these people could come into the country undetected, you could get out undetected. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we, this has gone so fast. I have so many more questions. But is there anything else that you feel all of the links to all of your, you know, your Twitter, the Occupy piece, your website, your the availability on your books, everything is below. So I'd take advantage of it. And, uh, and of course, you come out weekly now with the trends forecast. So, you know, is there anything else that that you would like our viewers to be aware of that we haven't talked? I mean, there's so much, but that we haven't talked about today. No, I think that's about it. And, you know, just to uh, really elevate the, the to, to elevate the system. People ask me, what should you do to to, you know, to prepare for the greatest depression? And the first thing that I tell them is to get in the best shape you can physically, emotionally and spiritually. And that's really important. And and it's it's not easy, but you know I mean we all go through crises in our lives, and if you're going to go down with it and not fight back, then that's your choice. Right. But knowing that it's coming, this is the time to plan for it. And of course, with the Trends Journal, it you went from a quarterly to a monthly, now a weekly. You know we're providing, we're trying to provide information each week to help people not only prepare for what's happening, but also showing them how to forecast and track trends 
So that's part of what we're doing as well. I mean, think about this, Lynette. Harvard, Princeton, Yale. What are they? Bullets, bombs, and banks. Now, one of them, Stanford, none of them, none of them teach trend forecasting. Nothing. But Nowhere. didn't you create you know a why? program for that? Well, I, well, I could, yeah, but mm-hmm. it's you go to school, they teach you history. This is what happened. Remember the dates. Don't forget. You know, so right. We're going to have a test. How about looking ahead? Mm-hmm. Looking ahead is not allowed. And you know why they don't have it in all these universities? No. Because they don't know how to do it. Yeah. Well, this time really flew, and I don't think we should wait too long to have you back again. Oh, no. There's so many things going on, and I need to come back to Kingston. So Anytime. We were were talking about it, and yeah, especially in the fall. Now it's getting gorgeous where you are. This is the time of year that I miss. But I want to thank you so much for all of your really hard work, not just coming on here for a few minutes, but, you know, you really are tireless and, you know, and I, I love you. What can I no, tell you? I do. You. And so that's it for today, everybody. I hope you got as much out of this as I did. And, you know, remember, financial shields are made with physical gold and silver. So until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye. <laughs>